Good evening, everyone. It is now 7.30 and we will get started. Uh, my name is Guion Foreman, president of the Chicago Police Board, and I'm calling the board's April 15th meeting to order. To protect the public's health in response to the COVID-19 outbreak, and as permitted by Governor Pritzker's executive orders 2020-07 and 2021-06, this meeting is taking place remotely. This meeting is open to the public via audio conference and is being carried live by CAN TV. Those participating by phone are on mute in order to reduce background noise and disruption. I will begin by taking attendance so it is clear who is participating in this meeting. Please say here after I read your name. Police Board Vice President Paula Wolf. Here. Board Member Matthew Crowd. Here. Board Member Michael Eady. Here. Board Member Steve Flores. Here. Board Member Jorge Montes. Here. Board Member John O'Malley. Here. Board Member Rhoda Sweeney. Here. Board Member Andrea Zock. Here. Superintendent of Police David Brown. Here. Chief Administrator of the Civilian Office of Public of Police Accountability, Sidney Roberts. Here. Deputy Inspector General for Public Safety, Deborah Witzberg. Here. Chief of Chicago Police Department's Bureau of Internal Affairs, Karen Konow. Here. General Counsel to Superintendent, Dana O'Malley. Here. Chief of the Chicago Police Department's Office of uh, Operations, Brian McDermott. Chief of the Chicago Police Department's Bureau of Detectives, Brendan Dinahan. Executive Director of Police Board, Max Caproni. Here. <clears throat> Thank you. Before we proceed to the items on the meeting agenda, I want to acknowledge that earlier today, as many of our participants know, the Civilian Office of Police Accountability released a video of the fatal shooting of 13-year-old Adam Toledo by, the Chicago, by a Chicago police officer. I and the members of the police board wish to express our condolences to the Toledo family as they continue to grieve the tragic loss of Adam. We also echo Mayor Lightfoot's statement. We acknowledge that the release of this video is the first step in the process towards the healing of the family, the community, and our city. The police board would like to contribute to this healing process and we have altered the items on the meeting agenda. We will begin with statements from COPA Chief Administrator Roberts and then Superintendent Brown. We will have time at the end of the meeting for public comments. Please join us in creating a positive climate for us to address the circumstances surrounding the tragic death of Adam Toledo and the very complex and urgent issues which have led to the devastating violence in our communities and the difficult job confronting the leaders and officers in the police department, as well as those who participate in this meeting each month. We continue to believe that the work of the police accountability process and the implementation of the consent decree must play a crucial role in addressing violence and community trust in policing. Once again, those participating by phone are currently on mute in order to reduce background noise and disruptions. When we get to the public comment portion of the meeting, we will unmute each speaker. Chief Roberts, uh, before you make your comments, I would like to acknowledge the hard work that, uh, that you and your team have put together uh, in, in releasing the video. Uh, I believe it's pretty unprecedented in the amount of time in which you released the video. We know that there's a lot of uh, hours, a lot of hard work that went into this. Um, so, and, and I know it's hard. Um, so thank you very much to, to you and your team for, for doing this and, and really stepping up. And so I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you now. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and um, as as you mentioned, and as everyone uh, is well aware, COPA released the uh, the transparency materials. Um, and when I say transparency materials, um, that's the video um, video evidence, um, OEMC records, as well as the associated arrest reports for the shooting death of 13 year old Adam Toledo. Um, you know, Copa reached out to the family um, actually the day that he was, uh, it became known um, who was shot. Um, and we had our first conversation with um, Mrs. Toledo. 
Um, and we kept in constant contact with the family over these last um, weeks, um, making sure they were fully aware of who we are, COPA, the civilian police oversight body, and what she could expect from us in the investigation, the level of uh, engagement that we will have, the amount of information that we will share with her um, and assured her um, that we would be available to answer any questions that she had. And we also let her know that day that we would be responsible for the public release of, of the, these video materials, but that before we did that, we would give her and her family the opportunity if they chose to review these video materials in advance of this information um, being made public. And the family did make themselves available for that. Um, and we accommodated their, their schedule um, so that they could review this material when the time was right for them. As all of you know, COPA has 60 days in which to release this video. Um, our duty is to make sure that we release that video as expeditiously as we can, but always with a prior advanced opportunity of the family to review that video and never before release of that video will compromise the integrity of this investigation or any of our investigations. And um, in this particular case, uh, when the family was ready, COPA was ready. Um, and we met with them and we sat with them and we talked to them and we talked to them about what they were about to, to, to witness um, and gave them all of the space that we possibly um, could give them. Um, as, as you guys have heard on numerous occasions, these are, um, this is very difficult um, and it's difficult for everyone. Uh, and it's also very difficult for the COPA staff to um, bear witness to these incidents, uh, sadly, over and over, um, over again. Um, but our job is to release those videos and to make them public to the families. But we try to do that in a uh, timely, but also compassionate way. Um, we do join the Toledo family. Um, the police board and other city officials in asking for calm. We ask for um, also patience to allow COPA to do the investigation. Um, video evidence is, is an important piece of our investigative uh, process, but it is not dispositive of our outcome. There is more substantively more investigation that COPA must, uh, must do. And we are doing that, um, but these investigations do not happen overnight. We are investigating the death of a young man that is going to take time, time for the interviews, time for the forensic analysis to come through, time to review the medical examiner's report, time for ISP to review their reports. And those things are things that COPA does not have control over. We are contingent and reliant upon external agencies to do their work so that COPA can reach a finding based upon all of the evidence. Our investigation is much more than just looking at a video and interviewing people. That we can do, we've already started that. But we also do not wanna close this investigation before we review ballistic evidence. We do not want to conclude this investigation before we do DNA analysis. We do not want to conclude this investigation until we receive the medical examiner's report. Those are all things that are done by agencies outside of, of the city. And so I ask for the public's patience to allow us to do a full and thorough and objective investigation an objective investigation of the entire incident that includes not only the officer's use of deadly force, but the actions of the other officers, what brought the officers there, what action they took while they were there preceding the shooting, and what happened afterwards. 
we do a full and thorough investigation. And that does take time. When COPA first got here, investigations were taking two and three years to be completed. In these last three years, through process improvements, efficiencies, better oversight, we are completing investigations in 18 months. That is our average. That has been unheard of by any civilian oversight agency before. And COPA and, and, and the city of Chicago has had civilian oversight for 50 years, 50 years, 1974, well, 47 years. And we are completing those investigations. And I don't mean investigations that we close without a full investigation. I'm talking about investigations that are completed pursuant to a full investigation. And I hate to use this word, but it is true. We, COPA, is investigating a homicide. This is a homicide investigation that takes time, that takes a full review and analysis of the investigation and proper oversight before we conclude our case. And we are committed to doing a full and thorough investigation. And the investigations that we have done in the past, I think are evidence that COPA will do a full and thorough investigations. Now, something um, President Foreman mentioned, I'd like to highlight. This release is 17 days after the shooting. And we were ready on day 11. It was delayed because the family wanted more time. This release included 20, the posting of 20 videos. But we reviewed many, or not many more, but there were other videos that were reviewed. We released audio material, documentary material, and all of this was released in 17 days. All while COPA is concurrently facilitating the release of two other officer involved fatalities that occurred within days of each other this past March. To accomplish this was a tremendous strain on our already burdened resources. However, providing the public a timely and comprehensive release of all of the relevant video and related materials into the conduct of COPA's investigative activities and affording transparency in the use of deadly force by the Chicago Police Department in accordance with the established city policy is of paramount importance and is the only way or one of the many ways that we gain the public's trust and confidence. And to this end, COPA will continue to release video materials timely, thoroughly, and publicly. And we will always do that in accordance with established city policy. Mr. President, that concludes my report. Thank you, Chief. Superintendent Brown. Thanks, Mr. President, uh, as you know, the specific details of this police involved shooting, including the comprehensive use of force investigation, which includes the use of deadly force, obviously are being investigated by COPA. Uh, but I wanted to convey with the full cooperation of the Chicago Police Department. Uh, the officer that was involved has been placed on administrative duties for a period of 30 days. If after COPA's investigations, any allegations are sustained and seeks a penalty of suspension of more than one year or separation, those recommendations will be forwarded to me. I will then have 90 days to review COPA's recommendation. If I agree, the recommendation is sent to the city's department of law to prepare charges for suspension or separation, which are then filed before the police board. If I disagree with COPA's recommendation, the decision goes before a one person panel of the police board for determination and possible referral to the entire board. It is important that as the, as the police department's 
final decision maker on COPA's recommendation for this investigation that I remain impartial and withhold any statement of opinion until presented with the evidence that COPA has gathered. As the COPA investigation continues, CPD will fulfill FOIA requests and produce reports related to this incident, which include arrest reports, any third party video, any tactical response reports, forms typically filled out by officers after an officer uses force. I wanna reiterate, COPA has Chicago Police Department's full cooperation. And finally, I want to convey my deepest condolences to the Toledo family and my appreciation for the family's call for calm and for peace during this difficult time. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, the process Superintendent Brown described can be found on the Chicago Police Board's website, chicagopoliceboard.org. Um, we have a video in English and in Spanish explaining the, the, the process. It's a, it's a complex process, uh, but we have a video as well as a chart explaining that. And so um, that information is there, or you could contact uh, Max Caproni at the police board office <clears throat> if you'd like any additional details. We would like to remind those here tonight that the police board members and staff <clears throat> are working with Jones Day Law Firm. Uh, whose members are helping us pro bono to upgrade our training and examine our responsibility to review and update the rules which govern police conduct in Chicago. Jones Day is researching what is happening in police accountability across the country, on the ground, and also the most rigorous academic and practical research. We are still on track to receive their recommendations this summer. The board will share our, our work on these issues at a future public meeting. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the board's March 18th regular public meeting? This is Paula Wolf, I so move. Michael Eady, second. <clears throat> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> motion passes. Our next regular public meeting will be held on Thursday. May 20th at 7.30 p.m. Whether this will be an in-person meeting or a remote meeting will be determined closer to the meeting date. Is there a motion to close a series of executive sessions for the purposes of considering personnel matters and litigation as authorized by sections 2, C, 1, 3, 4, and 11 of the Illinois Open Meetings Act? I so move, Paula Wolf. Second, Michael Eaton. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. A report of the disciplinary actions taken by the board during the previous month has been made available on the board's website. There is one police disciplinary case on the agenda this evening. <clears throat> the police board, as authorized by the Open Meetings Act, has considered in a closed meeting one police discipline case. The board will now take final action on this case. Regarding case number 20PB2977, the superintendent filed charges against police officer Saharat Sampin, recommending that he be discharged from the Chicago Police Department for making false statements regarding a police involved shooting. The superintendent subsequently moved to withdraw these charges because Sampin resigned his position with the CPD. Is there a motion to grant the superintendent's motion? So move, Paula Wolf. Second, Michael Eaton. I will now call on the members of the board for their votes. Wolf? Aye. Crow? Aye. Edie? Aye. Flores? Aye. Montez? Aye. O'Malley? Aye. Sweeney? Aye. Zop? Aye. And I vote in favor of the motion. Voting in favor are board members Wolf, Crow, Edie, Flores, Montez, O'Malley, Swinney, Zop, and myself. The motion passes by a vote of nine to zero. A written order will be entered as of today's date, sent to the parties and posted on the board's website. 
<clears throat> the general orders and other directives issued by the superintendent during the previous month are posted on the police department's website. <clears throat> As we move to public comment section of the meeting, I would like to remind everyone of the board's policy on participation at these meetings. We value your comments and questions on police related matters and we will treat you with courtesy and respect. We expect all members of the public to treat everyone at this meeting in a similar manner. I will now call upon members of the public who signed up in advance to speak. Each speaker will be unmuted after I call his or her name. Our first speaker, Gwendolyn Woodson. And Max, what are we, what are we, uh, what do they need to press to unmute? Uh, callers can press star six to unmute themselves. Thank you. Ms. Woodson. Next speaker, Lena Bivens. Ms. Bivens, star six to unmute. Next speaker, Refugio Gonzalez. Press star six. Next speaker, Darlene Tribune. Uh, I press star six. Okay, all right. I'll be soon. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, well, wait. We're gonna we're gonna back up. We'll go back to number two, Miss Bivens. Yes. Okay, let me go back to mute. Okay, who's first? Me and him. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> Let's start with Miss Bivens first. Okay. My name is Lena Bivens. I am a resident of the West Woodlawn on, 60, on 64th and Vernon. Uh, my concern is that in the West Woodlawn that we are having a numerous amount of shootings that have been happening during the winter months. And as it's getting warmer, um, more needs to be done in the community because it seems not to be done between Cottage Grove and King Drive, 63rd and 68th. There, there's much of action that is happening in the community. And I would like to emphasize that I would like to have a little bit more focused on um, the police department, on the residents in the community who are homeowners, people who are doing right, because they are the ones, we are the individuals who can help support what's going on. I don't believe there's enough going on. And I also have realized during this pandemic that there's a reason why the residents in the community are not involved. I am 45 years old and for 40 years, I've been living in distress, um, poverty stricken communities and none of these communities have communities that are really involved to help turn it around. And during this COVID, I have realized why that the residents are not involved because there needs to be a, a stronger and better initiative focused on community involvement because people are stressed out, they have PTSD, they're overwhelmed, and at times we feel like hostages to our community. So I wish a focus would put a little bit more on coming out the police department and talking, discussing, and working with the people in the community to get involved so we can help support the issues that's coming on in our community. And until that is done, West Woodlawn and many other communities I'll be here 20 years from now telling you I'm still waiting on a change to happen because a not has been done by the police department and other organizations to emphasize community involvement. Thank you. Um, Superintendent, would you like to respond? Yeah, and I have to apologize to the caller. I usually have those area deputy chiefs or their commanders on to specifically address those issues, but they're all uh, deployed uh, we have several protests uh, going on that are peaceful, so they're not able to jump on this call. But let me just uh, assure the caller that we will address their issue, that we have emphasized community policing, working with the community, collaborating with other city departments and nonprofits uh, for not only policing issues, but some of the quality of life issues that have been pervasive in the community throughout uh, not only th that particular area, but uh, throughout Chicago. So uh, we will make note and we would love to follow up, um, Mr. President, with the caller if we can get the contact information to make sure the commander and the area deputy uh, address those specific issues she raised. 
Okay, uh, so we'll make sure. I actually have an email here from, um, I think it's Lieutenant Charles Johnson. The, the third district has a weekly meeting on Fridays called Together We Can Partnership Program. It's held at the POA Woodlawn Resource Center, 6230 South Cottage Grove. Uh, they are adhering to social distancing. Uh, they ask people to wear a mask. Um, they do have Zoom information as well. Sergeant Charles Charlie Johnson, third district. Uh, so th that that's that's the regular scheduled meeting, and I can ensure that we can get that information uh, over to you and to your neighbors as as well. Um, the next speaker is uh, Mr. Gonzalez. If you could press star six, Mr. Gonzalez. Yes, uh, my name is Refugio Gonzalez. I'm with the Little Village Community Council Secretary on behalf of the uh, President Manuel Martinez. Uh, the Little Villages Community Council calls for no civil unrest. We call to start a community dialogue with elected officials, community leaders, youth groups to bring into Little Village community a comprehensive youth program. We understand what the mayor said today to really look forward to try to get more dialogue with these youth and we're prepared to help in that effort. Uh, uh, basically, we are, we're coming out publicly regarding the tragic death of Adam Polito today because we respected the family wishes and the privacy, time to mourn and loss of their beloved Adam Polito. But today it is our plea to bring the various parties together for a peaceful gathering to find solutions to the current state of our youth and to provide them with all the necessary support and programs, social economic services to endure a healthy and normal life. On behalf of the Little Bit Community Council, our President Manny Martinez is willing to meet with our district commander to, to assure him that we are in support of a good and safe environment for not only for Little Village, but all of the city of Chicago. And we hope that the mayor and other political leaders convene a youth conference with grassroots community workers and youth to gather information how to implement new programs that focus on education, wellness, recreation, and employment. And finally, we're committed to this monumental task to ensure that our youth will have the right to a better future and support of family and community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Darlene Tribute. If you can press star six. Okay, I got it. Hi, I'm Darlene Tribute. I'm the president of Park Manor Neighbors Community Council. And I'm speaking on behalf of not just our community, but Southside communities, as far as trying to keep everything peaceful in our neighborhood. Um, there are a lot of avenues right now going on in the city of Chicago for youth engagement, except the youth aren't coming. You know, that's one thing with the Cook Workforce Development Center on 79th Street. They have all kinds of programs and they're disseminating the information out. Um, but the youth seem to gather in other areas and some of them may have positive focus and with schools not being at their normal rate, with COVID being out here for uh, community activities to be normal, you know, everybody seems to be suffering. You know, we have um, Park Manor, Chatham, Woodlawn, Chesterfield, Avalon Park, and South Shore. We have a lot of chambers that are all trying to work together and with the Greater Chatham Initiative as well to try and gather some form of unity in every area of a community in this city. Um, in the process of that, we don't need to lose any of our stores in the process of civil unrest that we're hoping that we can have peaceful protests wherever they are and not go nuts like we did Memorial Weekend of last year. So I'm appealing to the superintendent and to the mayor and to everyone that we can maintain and sustain our neighborhoods in a safe way throughout what's going on, not just with you know, the shooting of um, Adam Toledo, 
but what's happening in Minnesota as well, that it doesn't spill over into Chicago as well, where we lose any more than what we've already lost. I appreciate my third and sixth district commanders and their community policing efforts and uh, all the efforts that they have been doing. We've got new commanders. They're doing a great job. And I want to compliment, you know, our police at this point. But, you know, we're expecting them to work miracles, and we're here to work miracles with them and help them. Okay? That's my only comment. Keep us safe. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next speaker, Sharon Pincham. If you can press star six, Sharon Pincham. Next speaker, Jennifer Edwards. Good evening, everybody. Um, Good evening. <clears throat> in trying to curtail crime, our community members have stepped up to involve several area con concerned groups, along with the six district CPD officers. We executed a walk to observe the 79th Street Business District that receives many 911 calls. We walk from King Drive to Champlain and we'll continue to Cottage Grove in our upcoming walk. We documented, <clears throat> excuse me, many BACP and COVID violations and we'll be working with city and police services to correct the issues. We appreciate any and all of the referrals from the CPD as a result of our presentations and ask for assistance in navigating how to connect with the appropriate city departments to correct the issues on 79th Street. We hope to help with the crime issues on 79th Street and would like to beautify the area in keeping with the West Chesterfield Community Association Good Business Neighbor Project. We intend to conduct these types of walks in other problem business areas in our communities on the South Side. We are pleased to have made new connections with the following standing organizations and new organizations. The Park Manor Neighbors, Community Council, Greater Chatham Alliance, Operation Safe Neighborhood, formerly Safe Pumps, Revere Caring and Sharing, Champs Male Mentoring, Sobno, and Chicago Playground Legends. We continue to connect for safety in our neighborhoods. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Eunice Chapman Regis. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good evening. I'm a member of Everhart 79ers Block Club and we have made many calls regarding Family Fresh Group Market located 457 East 79th Street, which continues to be a problem for our neighborhood. It continues to exhibit poor, Good business practices as detailed by Chicago's BACP. One loader has been parking his red motorcycle on a curb outside 457 East 79th Street. The business owner, Bobby, permits it. He permits loitering despite signing a no trespassing affidavit and also posting no traffic, no loitering on his stores. He harbors these miscreants and they don't live in our neighborhood. They promote illegal activity. On March 31st of this year, a community walk was conducted that included Communities organized to win our block club, six district commander Ben, the members of her cap team, our beat 624 beat facilitators, and other Chatham neighbors in the, from the third, third district. The walk originated the parking lot of 79th and Vernon, the library, and continued eastward on both sides of 79th Street to Cottage Grove. The purpose of the walk was to introduce businesses to the uh, city ordinances, no covering the windows, and um, help them sign no trespassing affidavit. One business was visited. I was with Commander Ben when she went specifically and told Bobby at 457 East 79th Street to remove the items that completely covered all the windows and to clear the debris that was piled in the windows because he was violating the city ordinance. To date, he has done none of that. The remainder of this presentation continues with the next speaker. I thank you for your time. Thank you. June Norfleet. Good evening. As my colleague Eunice says, we'll continue. April 6, uh, 2021, around 11.26 p.m., there was a shooting near 457 East 79th Street, wherein one individual was killed and another was wounded. 
This is a dangerous and unacceptable condition that exists on this intersection. Your phone log of CPD will attest to the fact that our neighborhood phone tree has made many calls, numerous calls to 911 to report the unquestionable, to report the questionable activities and illegal activities at this location. After our presentation on March 18th at the police board citing these problems, a phone call was received chief area one, Yolanda Talley, who wanted more in-depth information regarding the 457th Street incident. Deputy Chief Talley said she would pass the information on to the deputy chief uh, of area two because Talley did not work in our area, as Talley only attended the board meeting in the absence of area two deputy chief. Tap, uh, Talley said that both she and area two deputy chief would call. Mm. No phone call from either one has occurred. As one drives down State Street, several squad cars are stationed along this median. Why can't a patrol call be stationed at 79th and Everhart or 79th and Cottage Grove, a corner that seems to be a haven and a gathering point for these free willing illegal behaviors? Is it too much to ask that the police be assigned, even if only temporarily? We need help now before weather becomes more conducive and draws more and greater crowds uh, in this area. If the loop gets help, why can't we? We implore you uh, to act post haste. We are concerned about the habitual rotation of District C Six commanders every two years, and that doesn't help to stabilize our area and our community. Um, this uh, report will be forwarded to you, uh, President uh, Guillen. And uh, all of us here on the South Side extend our condolences to the Toledo family. We are grieving with them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, next speaker, Matt Brandon. Good evening, uh, President Foreman, members of the board, Superintendent Brown, command staff, and Chief Roberts. Communities organized to win continue this, continues this work of bringing police and community together so that we, as partners, can develop strategies and solutions to the issues that plague our communities. Although we recognize that the traditional priority calls, particularly felony and progress calls, take precedent, it is the typical nuisance calls that keep many of our neighbors up through the night and early morning hours. Large gatherings, street parties, illegal parking plague our areas. Colonious activity evolves from some of those occurrences resulting in violence, property damage, and the trashing of our street sidewalks and alleys around our homes. Calls to 911 are met with disdain and impatience. Our lifeline to the men and women on duty is tethered to the 911 call takers. Callers have been asked, are you calling again? Or we've already had that call, making us believe that our concerns are insignificant and therefore not recorded in totality. What seems unimportant to the call takers is of the utmost importance to our neighbors. Communication is the key to our partnership, so we've been told. It's got to get better. We're also concerned about the shortage of police officers in our district. Officer safety and response to calls for service are dependent on ad adequate staffing. We have made a promise to those officers in our community that we will continue to lobby for manpower. As you undertake the difficult task of reimagining how police services should and will be delivered going forward, a reduction in manpower isn't one of the answers. Thoughts and prayers out to the Toledo family and uh, kudos to Commander Watson and Commander Ben and to our men and women in blue, be safe and thank you. Thank you very much. Superintendent, so we, we've heard, uh, we hear from the, uh, the neighbors uh, on the South side quite a bit and they've been pretty diligent over the last year, year and a half. Um, and I think, you know, they're both complimentary as, as well as critical. It would be great if, uh, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure. I kind of turn it over to you to, to, to see if we can, uh, what we can do to try to, you know, make some incremental progress. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, one of the callers alluded to it. As we come out of the impact of COVID-19 on the community's ability uh, to meet in, in groups where we were before the pandemic, our interaction with our young people, with our, a lot of our programs, not only what we do with CPS, but City of Chicago has many programs for our young people to have 
been put on hold since last March. Uh, so we're, we're looking at a year of this um, quarantine and, and our, you know, our residents are apprehensive as well and congregating. So, but we, we see a light at the end of this tunnel of our ability to interact with the community more and more and more in, in large groups uh, so that we can have the kind of response that uh, all of these communities deserve. Uh, but I was just add the third and sixth districts have come up with very creative ways to social distance, wear a mask, and some on Zoom, but it is, it's just not the same as meeting in person, meeting in the community, you know, visiting with people um, in, in the neighborhood like we were before we were quarantined. So we, we are being aggressive with our community policing strategy. Uh, and we uh, hope soon as more and more people uh, take the vaccine, both doses, uh, and get out more comfortably and associate with one another and with the police department, we, we, we see that glimmer of light that we can uh, come out of this quarantining of, based on COVID-19 to uh, get back to some sense of normal interactions with each other. <clears throat> Thank you. Next speaker, Mr. John Perryman. Perryman, star six. <clears throat> Next speaker, Flora Suttle. Is Flora Suttle, press star six. Yes, I, excuse me, I press star, star six. Um, good evening. Good evening. Uh, Superintendent, board, Ms. Roberts, uh, Deputy Chief Roberts, speaking again, requesting that my son Derek Suttle case be reopened. You're very familiar with this case. He was fatally shot by an off-duty Chicago police officer who happened to be black, who dressed in a uniform after he shot him. He struggled with him and handcuffed him to the steering wheel on the arm in which he shot. And he also shot him in the chest. The case was closed. The investigation was not complete. I'm a former police agent. And I've asked uh, Chief Roberts to um, uh, look into this matter. I've asked the superintendent to look at his report, and I've asked Deborah Weisberg, uh, uh, the inspector general, to look into this matter. Uh, superintendent, the last time I spoke at the board, I didn't do any follow-up on you to ask you if you had seen the report of my son uh, by the detective division. Uh, Sidney Roberts, I know that you have uh, the information on Derek Suttle's case. I also submitted a um, Freedom of Information Act uh, pursuant to the uh, mayor's uh, executive order requesting that these, the information be released, all files be released on Derek. And I want them published too. And I want them, uh, uh, this has been since uh, 19, I mean, 2012. And um, Deborah Weisberg, I'd like to thank you for calling me the next day after the board meeting uh, and calling me to keep me informed on what it is that you're doing with my son's case. We have spoken every week and you uh, 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 informed me and I appreciate that. Um, and then finally, I'd like to give a compliment if I may to a sergeant uh, on the West side. Uh, she's a community policing sergeant. I noticed her and uh, several young men from the community going door to door in the 15th district. Her name is Asada Ogolaba. And I stopped her and asked her why they were going door to door. She explained to me that they had had a, a shooting on that block just the day before, this was April 1st. And they were out there a long time, knocking on doors and talking to people. And I just, I told her I would, I appreciated what she's doing. And we need more of that. So community policing in some areas, in fourth district, you're working hard and you're moving hard. I I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ms. Soto, I'm, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to stop you. I, I appreciate it. Um, and we received we also received written comments from uh, Ms. Witzberg. So um, I, I believe that that's going over to uh, COPA for a review. 
Um, next speaker, Zed Braden. Zed Braden, if you could press star six. Our final speaker, Mr. Robert Moore. Mr. Moore, if you're here, star six. Yeah. Mr. Foreman, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, it's Robert G. Moore, Chicago Police Board meeting of April 2021. Uh, Robert Chamber RJM for initials again expresses here in RJM's concern for the net consequences of RJM's activity to the cause which the salvation of souls constitutes and invites any citizen who's cognizant of RJM's record of activity in this regard to opine regarding whether in the balance the competent evidence of the overall effect of RJM's activity indicates that it constitutes a net source of utility to such cause or a source of detriment whereto without RJM possessing cognizance of such conditions. And yet the actual matter is that it constitutes a source of detriment whereto suggestions regarding modifications RGM can make to bring the overall effects whereto into a positive balance. Number one, regarding the March 2020 20 meeting, RGM spent 54 minutes trying to make a connection on a, a wherever it was, Menards, and it just didn't work with three phones and three devices. RGM has not reduced his commitment. There's no ab, there's just hopefully surge forward to, to make his widow's mic contribution, help fix these problems. Um, report regarding developments in nominal nation at large. There's an absolute truth. I think it's called Mike Liddell interviews at Douglas uh, G. Fib, uh, Douglas G. Franks. The evidence is overwhelming in the mind of this layperson that the election was stolen in 2020. It is treasonous, as RGM understands it, to defer to the activity of this nominal administration. These are tyrants by usurpation. The matter must be corrected. Douglas G. Franks. No one in the Superintendent of Chicago Police Department is not uh, inculpably ignorant at this juncture of what RGM is making this claim. RGM here nominates Kenneth Ken Kendall. There might be, Kenneth Kendall is a SWAT team member, University of Indiana, Gordon Tech High School graduate. He's the guy that maybe the city of Chicago Police Department can least afford to lose. He is nominated to be made assistant superintendent immediately. With this guy hard in the target, adult healthy rhinoceros does not get attacked. You put this guy next to you, Superintendent Brown, you will be uh, sorry, Mr. Moore, your time is up. And I, I apologize that I skipped over one name. Uh, Miss Krista Noel, you can press star six, Miss Noel. Miss Noel? Yeah, I'm here. Um, so the first thing I have to say is Mississippi, goddamn. A mama calls the police to have you find her missing child and you bring him back in a box. Stop releasing these videos like lynching ads. We don't need to know when you're releasing it. We don't need to know the date. Just put it up. Stop getting all this press on these snuff films. Now, we got to have some community agreements with the police. If I put my hands up, that means don't shoot me. And how do you think you're effective if you're willing to shoot children complying with your orders? And don't forget Anthony Alvarez. You shot him, too, and I'm sure you got that on video, too, and I don't hear nothing about you releasing that one. And we offered the youth council through the consent decree and got blocked. Adam and Anthony could have been alive right now. And you know what to keep us calm? You asking us to stay calm? You know what to keep us calm? Stop killing us. Stop killing us. No excuses. Stop killing us. Thank you, Ms. Noel. At this time, all members of the public who signed up to speak have been called. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved, Paul Wolf. Second. No, I haven't spoke. Hello? Yes. This Gwen Woodson, I would like to speak. I was the first one. You didn't come back to me. Oh, okay. I apologize. All right. We'll hold off. We'll hold off on the motion to adjourn. Uh, Ms. Woodson? Yes. 
Okay, my ideal statement is related to the whole opening of the meeting right here with the community and the police. And the community slogans and slogans and everything is to serve and protect. And by law, the community is 99.9% right. Also, the police is 99% right, 99.9% .9 right. But percentage that's keeping them from being on the same level, even though they have the same percentage of writing. And that little percentage in my eyes that I see is that to serve and protect, it needs to be a full statement to state to equally serve and protect. And that will close all the gaps. It may not do it spontaneously, but it will close a many a gap, especially with conversations I have just heard. And it will also cost all cities and states very little money to just add that one word across the top of to serve and protect. That way, the community and the police, they will have more security within each other, and they can also have the safety of working together on a more open and freely basis. And my appeal is going out to all of the cities and states with mayors and superintendents, and this will make a more calmer USA. And if you agree, I would like to put this in motion as a law because it's mandatory to be done. And it will resolve a lot and it doesn't cost a lot. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I believe that all callers who signed up to speak have, have been called upon. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Yes, I renew my motion, Paul Wolf. Second, Mike Weedy. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion passes and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Please stay safe. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. Likewise. Good night.